Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Cancer of the ovary is fortunately relatively rare, but it can be very difficult to detect, very difficult to diagnose. And some cases aren't diagnosed until the cancer has already spread to the abdomen or other parts of the pelvis. What do you do then? Joining us in studio to talk about newer and novel treatments for ovarian cancer is the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, Dr. Matthew Robertson. Welcome to Minnesota. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. (laughs) Dr. Robertson, nice to have you on the program. So I I read recently that uh, we know that ovarian cancer is one that that women don't want to have. It's difficult to treat, difficult to diagnose. But I saw that the the number of women being diagnosed with ovarian cancer is actually decreased. That is true. According to statistics from the American Cancer Society, we are indeed seeing a slight decrease. And do we know why? No, we really don't. Uh, There are a lot of theories out there. There were tubal ligations, um, hysterectomies, some of the protective factors that we're aware of. Uh, may be playing a role, but at this point, we're not exactly certain. If you've had a hysterectomy, you're less likely to get ovarian cancer? Yes, sir. Oh, interesting. But do we know why that is? Well, hysterectomy itself is removal of the uterus. Uh, So you would think, how's that going to protect you if the ovary and the fallopian tubes are still there? But retrospective data looking at women who only had the uterus removed, they actually have a decreased uh, incidence of ovarian cancer. It's thought that it may somehow affect the blood supply to the ovaries, but we don't know that definitively. What are the risk factors, though, is obesity? And we hear every day that the obesity rate is greatly increasing in the country. And so then it surprises me that it doesn't seem to go hand in hand. Agreed. Hmm. Uh, some other risk factors, some other women who are at higher risk. Well, we there's two, uh, if you will, broad overreaching themes, um, incessant ovulation. Uh, the theory there is that there's some type of trauma, if you will, to the surface epithelium uh, of the ovary. What's that so mean? That, so, in other words, when the follicle ruptures in the ovary. Follicle the, is the egg. Yeah, coming out of the ovary when as the ovary tries to repair itself. So, in other words women who are ovulating more likely in their lifetime more may have a higher risk. Mm. Now, that is one of the reasons that birth control pills, where women don't ovulate, pregnancy, breastfeeding, et cetera, why these may be protective. The other theory then goes into some of the local hormonal concentrations, how that may be affecting it. And then certainly, as we learn more and more about our uh, human genome, we know that ladies who have, unfortunately, either a BRCA mutation, BRCA1 or 2. A gene um, mutation. A gene mutation. Lynch syndrome. This is familial uh, colon cancer. We know there's a higher risk of ovarian cancer as well. And then with our expanding knowledge, in addition to those, we're BRIP1, uh, RAD51C and D, all these genetic mutations as we learn more and more those are placing women at higher risk. What about women who have had previous fertility treatment? Indeed. Are they at increased risk? They are at increased risk. And then what about a family history? Family history can be, even if a, a, a mutation is not detected, there is some thought that indeed they may have a mutation, which we're simply not seeing at this time. So ovarian cancer becomes much more difficult to treat if it has already spread, either regionally or throughout the body. Um, Tell us about the stages. Um, It's it's always difficult for many of us to understand because there are different stages for different cancer. Tell us about the stages of ovarian cancer. Stage one is when the disease is confined to the ovary. Stage two, it's confined to the pelvis below the pelvic rim. Stage three is when it's disseminated throughout the abdominal cavity. And stage four is when it's either spread into uh, the lungs. A lot of times there'll be fluid at the base of the lungs with malignant cells. Or when it's within the substance of the liver, substance of the spleen, or even the inguinal lymph nodes. And very difficult to treat in later stages. How do you, uh, chemotherapy, surgery, how are the main ways to treat ovarian cancer? The traditional approach has been twofold um, in that we quite simply try to cut out as much as possible. There's very good data that um, the amount of disease remaining is going to determine the lady's prognosis of being cured. But 
even if we finish the operation when there's no visible disease, we know that there's always microscopic disease left behind, and that's why our treatment has always been surgery with chemotherapy to follow. And sometimes tell us about the more novel treatment methods that you're using now in in chemotherapy in the abdomen in particular. So there was a study a number of years ago that uh, showed that giving chemotherapy within the abdomen uh, by having a indwelling catheter improves survival. So that's a little tube that goes into the abdomen and you put the chemotherapy in that way? Yes, sir. And the problems that we ran into were just catheter maintenance. It could become clogged. It could lead to infection, et cetera. So it it really was not well tolerated by patients. It was difficult for physicians to manage the complications, et cetera. So Fast forward, we have now learned and, uh, that HIPEC, heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy, given at the time of surgery, has been shown in a randomized study that came from Europe. Uh, it was published, uh, I believe, January of last year, 18, and uh, New England Journal showed that for patients who had received half of the chemotherapy of their usual prescribed dosage up first, and then went for surgery if you were able able to have no residual or optimally debulked, in other words, no tumors remaining less than one centimeter, that those patients who received HIPEC then recovered and completed their chemotherapy, those patients had an improved overall survival. What difference does it make? I mean, it sounds more comfortable, but why should it be warm? Why does it need to be heated? Great question. Um, it's, it's mechanisms. Um, I've got a colleague uh, in Jacksonville who does a tremendous amount of this with his colon cancer as well, and it's his opinion, and I'm going to be very clear, this is an opinion, but it may have something to do with affecting the immune response within the abdominal cavity. But it's very clear as well that um, heated chemotherapy causes increased penetration in the mm-hmm. tumor, It causes apoptosis, fancy medical term for killing of tumor cells. It activates what are called heat shock proteins, which are receptors for natural killer cells. So that therefore, once again, that this is somehow hopefully stimulating the local immune response. Have you proven that this improves survival? That study did, yes, sir. All right. Well, one other uh, modality I want to ask you about, because this is so difficult to treat, you've talked about... uh, chemotherapy inside the abdomen, heated chemotherapy. What about intraoperative radiation? Tell us about that modality. IORT uh, is uh, fortunately rarely used, but it is um, utilized in very unique situations. And often this is when we have pelvic sidewall disease. We tend to do it in the GYN oncology field more often with cervical cancer, but there are unique situations with ovarian where it could be employed as well. So you give the radiation actually in the operating room with the, with the patient's abdomen open? That is absolutely correct, yes, sir. Yeah, and so you can give more uh, chemotherapy in a localized area where you see recurrent tumor or you th- suspect there's a recurrent tumor. Well, once again, that's radiation therapy. Radi- so, yeah. you're, so you're funneling down, um, you're limited the amount of spread of the radiation. You're really t- able to focus it on a very small area because the machine is in very close proximity to where the tumor was. All right. Prognosis overall for women with ovarian cancer. Is it improving? It is. Uh, You know, I finished my training in the late 90s, um, and at that point, our five-year survival rates were about 30%, all comers, all stages. Now we're getting close to 50%, all stages combined. And a majority of women, even though you have uh, treated them, they get a recurrence. Unfortunately, about 70% of all comers will at some point develop a recurrence. That is correct. All right, cancer of the ovary, fortunately, relatively rare, often diagnosed late. It is very treatable, but some 70% of women do, in fact, get a recurrence. Despite that, there are newer and novel treatments available to treat the disease. Our thanks to Dr. Matthew Robertson from the Mayo Clinic in Florida. Thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you.